Jumping in on Manx Radio with Howard and Chris Kane. Hello, good evening, and welcome. Saturday night, 9 o'clock. It can mean only one thing. The best sounds in modern and contemporary jazz as we launch ourselves into another session of Jumping In with myself, H. And me, Chris. Yes, welcome along to this week's Jumping In on a fine main day. And yes, we're back within bickering distance. And another one of our specials with Grammy Award winning soprano sax player Jane Arabloom and bassist Mark Elias, who we were looking up to catch up with quite recently. And they tell us of the problems of remote recording Recording, among other things, but before that, what's been in pole position for you this week, H, other than your uh, Maypole, obviously? Well, we'll be catching up with their latest album, of course, which they've been talking about, recorded over Zoom, and we're going to have a bit of art and aviation. If we can fit it in, I'll try a bit of Mark Elias as well. And for me, well, something new, old and new, a fun font across the sea, a musical scale, and to kick things off, an implicate order. Here's The Underdog. Thank you. 
Inspired by Charles Mingus's The Black Saint and the Sinner Lady, that was The Underdog, taken from British trumpeter Nick Waters and his Paradox Ensemble, and their third release, Implicate Order, on the Dot label. The band is not perhaps your usual big band, fusing spiritual and eastern jazz moods with West African rhythms and electronics, but for the most it stays in the groove and explores a comfortable set of charts, putting me in mind perhaps of a a band from some years ago that we used to enjoy, Roland Perrin's Evidence. Anyway, I uh, just had to have that kind of vibe, but check it out. Very good indeed. Great way to start the programme. Jumping in, Chris and H. Bit of a special today. So, yes, we have a lovely talk with you now. Or for you now, I should say, with Jane Ira Bloom and Mark Elias. Perhaps not well known to everyone. I've been a great fan of Jane's for a long time and Mark's been on the scene for an equally long time, 40 years plus or more, playing with the likes of Dewey Redman and such like. Between them they play with a whole scutch of people. Jane, a specialist on the soprano, way back with the beginnings of electronics as well, bringing in there some cracking albums and we're going to hear one a little bit later on in the programme. I've never had a chance to see her live, unfortunately, though we have seen Mark Elias on a couple of occasions at least and it'd be lovely to uh, yeah catch them live again in what they are terming perhaps as they look towards the new world, uh, some kind of tomorrow, as they put it. Another tomorrow as we come out of lockdown. We caught up with them a little bit earlier in the year when we were all still in lockdown, including them, to hear about their new album, Some Kind of Tomorrow, and how it had been recorded, which basically was over Zoom to all intents and purposes. We started by just saying to them, well, how on earth did it actually come about? Through desperation to connect and play music, literally, I mean... Both Jane, we've talked about this a lot because through the process. We didn't plan on doing an album. We just got together and started playing over Zoom in, I guess, in April might have been the first seance. And, you know, it was rough because I think we were trying to record in Zoom and it was a disaster, you know. Um, I mean, we just tried all the gambits, you know. And then as it improved and our uh, ability to to play in a more natural way and just close our eyes and connect was that became possible. In, in the virtual world, uh, Howard, it, it's like, this is like the equivalent of a live recording. <laughs> it's about as live as it gets. Mark and I, no compositions, no, no prepared anything. We're just improvising with each other.
Travelling Deep from Jane Ira Bloom and Mark Halias' album recorded over Zoom. And, uh, of course, that's not something that comes without its own set of difficulties. We had a big band uh, earlier in the year who'd managed to do it, but it was really, really involved. So I asked them with just two of them and, more pertinently, improvising live, how do you keep it all synchronised together? This is a magical question. Mark, you got to talk about this. It's, this is like the Twilight Zone thing about this <laughs> recording. <laughs> We're really trying to... I, I still don't quite understand because I, I measure the latency because we yep. both re- recorded in situ, you know, in our, in our own houses. And then Jane would send me the files, but we would do this clap test like this, yep. mm-hmm. where we would try to clap. Yeah, she would start clapping and I'd join her and it would be off like 250 milliseconds. So then I would take the claps and line them up and then everything was fine. But the weird part was that when we were playing, if I went into a groove with chord changes, for example, that she heard and she was responding to them and playing them, they were in time with me, harmonically lined up and temporally lined up. Even though if we counted off a medium up tempo and tried to play together, it was a disaster because you would hear the other person late, then you would try to compensate. Yeah. But for some reason, when we were improvising, and I still don't know what happened with this, I'm not sure. I, 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 it's like, I don't know if you know about Schrodinger's cat, you know, with the <laughs> quantum mechanic. Well, the, in this case, the cat is dead and alive, you know. <laughs> Mark, I think this is a neuroscience question. I really it might, do. It might be. Yeah. I, I think it's something about the brain of improvisers is is making an unconscious adjustment. Even though we're not even aware of it, conscious of it, um, we're uh, doing some kind of anticipation uh, based on what we know this reality is. And, and somehow it lines up. <laughs> yeah. Somehow. <laughs> Thank you. 
we've played together for quite a while. So yes, there's improvisers, you know, we have a shared vocabulary, you know, it's, again, we don't talk about this, but you know, there's a lot that we can draw on and anticipate and, um, and trust. Yeah, you can't just you can't just do this with anybody. <laughs> you wouldn't come out the same. <laughs> and that's a fascinating thing in itself, isn't it? Because whilst the two of you must have a, a an empathetic bond in many ways, going back toward the nineteen seventies, I guess. But when you've not got that human interaction, you're doing it completely distant. Do, does it remove an, an element of the spontaneity in the improvisation, or how does it actually feel? Because it's obviously very different. Well, I, I, I go back to neuroscience. <laughs> I think. There's something uh, about the need and the desire to want to connect with the other that's become so apparent to, to many musicians and to Mark and I that there's almost a, a heightening of your sensory ability to reach out to the other. It, it's like a kind of deep listening, a deep focus of some kind. It's different. It, it, there is a, a relaxation that, that does happen, but I think there is something that's going on that that is like a uh, hyper, hyper aware. And I, I, other people experience this too. Like when you do Zoom calls, you everybody gets so exhausted, you know, because you, you're focusing so hard, you know, um, and you don't realize all the different sensory muscles that you're using to do it that are not like just hanging out with somebody and, you know, and relating. So there's some, definitely something extra going on. I think the other, when you're playing, I think the your mind does something like like what the brain does with a phantom limb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the bass is so important like to us <laughs> to the soprano saxophone. He's there. I also create him there too in, in somewhere in my mind. So it's something I don't know, this is kind of philosophical, but something is going on. Mark, you got to take it from here because I'm getting well, I'm getting lost. To, well, for one thing, uh, we've prepared our entire lives for this, in a way. You know, the skill sets that we got from being composers and improvisers for 45 years or more. Um, I mean, when I go on stage, I pretty much close my eyes unless I'm reading music and yeah. just listen and feel. You know, so it got to the point pretty quickly for me where this was not at all unfamiliar in the sense that I when once we got the sound together uh forget the latency I don't even know what that was you know but in terms of like the interaction between the two of us once we got the sound together where I could really hear her sound and feel the sort of strength of that intention I was just like we were playing in the same room literally that's what it felt like to me Improvisers do this all the time when you go in the studio, you know, and everybody's in cans, you know, in, in separate mm -hmm. booths and stuff. Yep. We're using a skill that we've we've used in studio for a while. It's absolutely the case. Jane, Ira Bloom and Mark Halias talking to us about their latest album, which has been recorded over Zoom, Some Kind of Tomorrow. And she's saying about working together. They've worked together, Jane, Ira and uh, Mark Halias, for a long time, along quite often with uh, Bobby Previtt on drums. And it is that sense of... Just knowing each other, like all great jazz musicians, it's intuition. You just know somehow or other how it's going to go. Have a listen to Jane with Mark Elias and Bobby Fravit with Song Patrol from our album Early Americans.
Jane, you started uh, not on the saxophone as your original uh, instrument, of course, but do you think, and probably the question stands for Mark as well, that both of you having that inherent uh, knowledge of harmonic instruments makes a big difference when you're playing with a, a, a full supportive harmonic uh, rhythm section. Do, do you hear the development of, of chords or the structure within your head, do you think, when you're improvising? I totally. think so. I totally. think so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I never I, I never bought the idea that the bass wasn't a harmonic instrument. Gotcha. <laughs> I mean, really? And, and we can play more than one tone at the same time. Of course. So can Jane. Yeah, you know? right. Yes. <laughs> no. uh, what for you, Jane, is the, is the fascination of the soprano? Because I think you started on alto, and then obviously since then, the soprano is bringing your primary instrument. What is it that pulls you to the soprano for jazz? Well, it, it's it's sort of a... <laughs> kind of picked me early on I was, I was I think I was even still in my teens when I knew that 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 soprano was a voice that was was special to me um uh it's an interesting instrument of the saxophone family it's a little hard to finesse intonation wise and it, it's an instrument that I, I tell people it takes a while uh to get it together so that you can get your voice come through on the instrument as opposed to the instrument dictating to you how it has to sound yes. <laughs> so i think that's the challenge of it i love it um i had a great sound in my ear when i was quite young with a great saxophone master by the name of joe viola and that was the sound that i heard and i said i like that i, I want to do that <laughs> And then when did he get into the, uh, which I love your use of electronics, you're quite an early adapter, I guess, and have always managed to integrate it, as I think you have done subtly in a couple of tracks here, into your music without it dominating. I think it always just adds a sort of, uh, a sort of an esoteric twist to it somewhat without overpowering the music. How did you first get into the electronic side of things? I think I've always been a space cadet, but Mark's going to laugh at this. I think so. My early experiments with live analog electronics happened at the Yale Electronic Lab, uh, learning about Moog synthesizer. You know, Moog synthesizers back then were something that looked like refrigerators. Yeah. <laughs> with the big sliders and stuff uh, with all the waveforms on them. I, I remember studying electronic music when I was in college, and uh, it found its way into my performance vocabulary. I play with a, uh, a couple of very old, you know, almost antique uh, analog effects boxes which I trigger with foot pedals. And the way I use it is like as if it were part of, of the horn. It's, it's a natural, I can turn it on and off as quickly as I can push a key. So that, that's my point of view about it.
Bloom from her album Art and Aviation, uh, recorded back in, I think, the 1990s, that one in the Stella lineup. Jane on soprano sax, and of course, using, as we, she's just talking about there, that subtle use of electronics, which she does so well. A track called Gateway to Progress uh, in the company of, yeah, the late great Kenny Wheeler, Jerry Garnelli on the acoustic and electric drums, Rufus Reed bass, Michael Fomaniak, Ron Horton, and Kenny Werner. And uh, yeah, that one, if you ever see it knocking around, Art and Aviation. Really well worth checking out. Well, we came to the end of our little interview, but uh, you may be thinking, listening to this, that it's space age music, and indeed, in the case of Jane, it is. I asked her, how did you come to be one of the first jazz artists to be approached to write music for NASA? Definitely one of the high points of my career, no <laughs> question about it. I, to this day, that experience still resonates with me. Um, I was invited to be a member of, of something called the NASA Art Team, which up until the 80s, was all, all visual artists who were asked to observe things that, that go on at NASA and then contribute a work of a visual work of art. And uh, I happened to have met the head of ser- special services back then. And uh, fortunately, he was a jazz fan. <laughs> and uh, over the years of corresponding with this guy, the idea came up, well, how about it's time to NASA to commission a musician? And uh, honestly, that, that's really the way the whole thing started. Uh, I've always been interested in space exploration, how sound changes when it moves, uh, you know, anti-gravity environments. That's always been my kind of like interests. I don't So it it was just over a period of time that those things merged with my musical interests. I remember reading a downbeat downbeat interview, uh, Jane, with you a couple of years ago. The trio album came out, Mark, as well. And, And you'd said that actually went right back to the early part of your saxophone career where you enjoyed to play just with the bass and did that come up in your conversations before this project was launched i just love the bass i love the way mark plays there's nobody i'd rather be playing with sure <laughs> you know we, didn't know uh, we, miss, we missed our drummer friend bobby brevet our, our trio but you know yeah. hey it's rough with three you know with three on zoom <laughs> Part and of the, the drums the latency really is an issue to sort out isn't it yeah, yeah. and density and density yeah. you know yeah, yeah. Are you optimistic looking forward for for the music and getting back and hoping that we can get back to some kind of normality and actually back out into the live scenario again where we can all play and go and watch us as we used to? I've always felt that optimism was just a choice and a, and a logical one in the sense of uh, since you don't know what's going to come, um, you feel a lot better by being optimistic. And I don't mean delusionally optimistic. I'm just saying you choose to be positive just because sure. it feels better and it doesn't change anything to be negative, you know, other than ruining your day. You know, and yeah. possibly and your there's nothing day. negative. There's nothing negative about, mu- no, about music making. I mean, there's no music that was ever built on a, a negative impulse ever. <laughs> and made us yeah. realize just how much we miss performing. Yeah. yeah, it's like euphoric. I mean, we can't live without it. We, uh, just having a little bit of time without it was like, no, no, this can't be. Mm-hmm.
Well, jazz festivals may come and go, but as Great British festivals face the problems of COVID and finance and all the rest of it, one that will always hold a special place in my heart is Bracknell, not just for the great variety of new music it brought for the stage, but for all the musicians it nurtured. And it was back in 1986, can you believe, when we saw Don Cherry and New on the stage. And that's available as an album live at Bracknell in the BBC series, just under the name of Don Cherry. But that was the fabulous New, which was actually the band that we saw there, but not at Bracknell in that instance. Yeah. Caught live in Glasgow, playing Terrific. Carlos Ward's Pettiford Bridge. Don Cherry, of course, with his famous pocket trumpet. Ed Blackwell at the drums, the much, much missed in- Monty instrumentalist who played with Pat Metheny and so many other people. Nana Vasconcelos on, uh, well, everything, really. <laughs> uh, Carlos Ward on sax, of course. And the bassist and one of our guests today, Mark Helias. And that uh, recent release, live in Glasgow, new live in Glasgow on Bandcamp, comes from a private tape in Mark's own collection. That is terrific stuff, I must admit. It's well worth checking out, uh, going to Bandcamp and looking for that one and uh, yeah, hearing Mark in a different setting. He's been around for so long and played in so many different settings. Like I said, uh, certainly you'll hear him with Julie Redmond several times, um, plays with Jane, obviously, and has been playing quite some time. We've seen him with New a couple of times, as well as Chris was saying there, which was a uh, wonderful and, again, lovely, nice, rounded bass player. And such a joy talking to Jane and Mark down the line from uh, New York. They seemed really nice uh, guys, and uh, they said, yeah, lovely, you know, we get back into the real world, come and say hello. So uh, we're hoping... Touch wood, that might actually come to pass at some stage and we might be able to go and actually <laughs> see them in the real world. That would be really terrific. Yes, I mean, COVID has obviously been a huge, and still is a huge disaster globally, but one thing that has done very nicely for jumping in as it's given us the ability to talk to some people whose diaries would otherwise have been overflowing and we wouldn't, have, wouldn't have had to Pat Matheny still got away, I'm afraid. But, yeah. Pat Matheny got away, we but tried. we do have, coming mm. up in the next few weeks, uh, a few more specials to look forward to. Uh, we've got Tommy Smith uh, talking about his new release and uh, all things Scottish and jazz and we've also got the great Joe Lovano well that's about it for this week's Jumping In we hope you've enjoyed it Uh, thanks of course to our guests and we've just about time to leave you with a taste of musical mayhem which is uh, the sample laden um umlumbo I talked about space music before. Just have a listen to this. Caught live with their guest on the album Celestial Mechanics Jane Ira Bloom here's Musical Scale Stay in space Bye for now 
two, three. Who are you? I'm the golden rectangle. Uh. I'm our old friend Pythagoras. I'm the musical scale of today. You know I get funny, little man. Big beer. the musical scale of today. Yeah, that's good because something else we've done about it.